Hey everybody, it's Dan from Weld Fever. How you doing? On today's episode, a friend of mine brought me some kind of a thingamajig that needs some welding repair. So I'm going to go ahead and tackle that today and I hope you guys find it uh, entertaining. Stick with me, here we go. So here is the object in all its splendor. Now, my buddy that brought this over to me, he's into uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and he tells me this is something that he uses on the job here. I believe it has something to do with uh, propping up or holding up uh, either air conditioning units or some type of uh, equipment that he has uh, so that he can get them into place and uh, basically affix them to wherever they're going to go. Anyway, uh, I don't pretend to know exactly what this thing is, but what I do know is that it suffered a catastrophic failure on one of these legs here, and as you can see, it is severely bent over. So what he's asked me to do is to remove this leg and uh, basically replace it, and that's exactly what we're going to do for him today. So let's get started. Okay, so as you can see here, I went out to my uh, steel yard and I purchased uh, just a small length of uh, square tubing or box tubing as it's also referred to and I got lucky on this one because there happened to be a, a spare cutoff piece and so I was able to purchase it at a scrap price so uh, it's exactly the same uh, uh, inside diameter as this other piece here so it's gonna work out just fine now all we need to do is uh, clean up clean it up a little bit it's got some oil on it and some residue that never goes well with welding so we'll clean that up and if you'll notice on this one here there are a couple of holes and we're gonna have to drill those holes as well actually there's two here and one up top so I'll go ahead and drill those all out anyway let's move on to the next part of this okay so for this uh, I'm gonna use some acetone you see I have it in a plastic squeeze bottle and acetone is uh, able to be stored in these little plastic squeeze bottles which is convenient I've probably mentioned this before but acetone is probably the best uh, solvent or cleaner to use uh, for welding purposes. Uh, it's very clean, it doesn't contain in it anything in it which will uh, contaminate your welds. So it's probably the best cleaner for welding. So this is what I'm gonna do. I've got a rag, notice I'm wearing gloves because we don't need to get this stuff on our skin. I'll spray up the rag and just go ahead and start cleaning all this off and you notice already, look how much junk is on there. This will contaminate your weld so you gotta make sure that you get this off before you weld. Okay, so if you'll notice here, uh, there is a rod sticking out of the back here, and it's all bent up. And this rod is connected to this, uh, I'll bring this over here, this retractable leg. So in order for me to get this out, I'm going to have to either straighten out this rod or actually cut it. Uh, I don't know. I don't think there's any way to really save that rod, so I think I'm just going to have to cut it. So uh, now I just got to figure out how I can get in there and cut it so that I can get this thing out. Um, gee, we'll see how it goes. Give me a second, I'll be right back after I come up with a solution. So after racking my brain endlessly, the best I could come up with is pounding the darn thing with a hammer like a caveman. <laughs> so I guess I had to resort to uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, destructive uh, nature here in order to get this done. Uh, actually, the reality is the pin was uh, bent in there so badly that, uh, and so is the leg, that I had to straighten it out a little bit just to try to get some movement out of it. So uh, the hammer is the first step in this whole thing here, and as you'll see, uh, we're going to continue and do something else. Now, I probably went overboard here. I could have just very easily cut this thing and pulled the whole thing out, but I figured, you know... Uh, let's make it interesting. So I started by cutting uh, the edge or the one end of the uh, rod. Okay, no big deal. Frankly, now that I think about it, I don't know why I did that, but I decided to do it. And then I thought I'd have fun since this was going to probably be a video for uh, YouTube. I figured, what the heck, uh, let's uh, pull out the torch. Let's get the rosebud going. And let's heat up this piece and let's uh, bend the thing straight and then hopefully the uh, rod will just slide out there so uh, that's what I'm doing now I've sped this up uh, you'll notice this rosebud this gives me an opportunity to talk about a rosebud a rosebud is a heating uh, torch for an oxyacetylene or an oxy fuel setup 
This particular one is oxyacetylene. I will tell you the secret to a rosebud is that you need to max out that acetylene as far as you can go. Now, if you know anything about acetylene, you know that uh, its maximum working pressure is 15 psi. You cannot go beyond that. If you look at an acetylene regulator, you're going to see that it redlines at 15 psi, and that's for good reason. Anything above 15 psi uh, pressure on acetylene is going to make it unstable. So you never, ever want to adjust it for me on that. But when you use a rosebud, you're going to get darn close to it. Uh, for this one, I think I was up to about 12 psi. And I had about, uh, I think, 40 to 50 psi of oxygen for this as well. Uh, that allows enough uh, pressure to make this rosebud go. If you don't have enough acetylene going through there, you're going to get a lot of loud pops and sometimes a big pop that's going to actually shut the torch off. So uh, <clears throat> if you're going to try to use this thing, you definitely need to have a, a worthy amount of... Uh, or I should say a substantial amount of acetylene to make it happen. Also, I shoot for a neutral flame, and the way to know if you have a neutral flame is if you look at the small little blue cones at the bottom, uh, they will be uh, very, uh, very uh, blue in appearance, very bright, uh, and they will have kind of a rounded over uh, tip to them, not entirely pointy, definitely not translucent, uh, you just have to kind of get a feel. If you have a cutting torch, you can kind of figure out a little bit better. Anyway, uh, enough of that. Uh, I basically got this thing straightened out uh, to as far as I can go. And uh, the next step was to kind of pound it and get it a little straighter and see what happens. So let's uh, continue with the next part of this. Now here's the kind of silly part, after all that uh, struggling and uh, warming it up with a torch and straightening it, I ended up doing the inevitable anyway and that's cutting the piece out. So <laughs> here's, here's me cutting the piece out. Okay, once the piece was freed, uh, now I decided I had to uh, take some of the paint off because this is where we're going to weld the new, paint, the new piece on. And uh, if you don't remove the paint at least a couple of inches back, from where you're going to weld, that paint is going to start smoking. It's going to get into your uh, breathing. You're going to breathe that in and it's bad for you, obviously. But not only that, it's going to contaminate your weld. So always make sure that you uh, take paint down at least uh, two inches away from uh, where you're going to weld. Now on to the chop saw and the replacement piece. Uh, you see I have it all chucked in there and clamped down and I'm just going to very simply make a uh, quick uh, 90 degree cut and uh, go ahead and uh, get this guy cut out. That way I can replace it. The next order of business is to mark out the holes that have to be uh, drilled into the replacement piece. Now there are a number of ways to go about this, but I like to get like a square and just go ahead and trace center to center and mark them off that way. And then I center up the marking uh, to get it directly center of the piece. And uh, providing I did it okay, it should all work out quite well. So let's hope for the best here. Okay, after having selected the appropriate bit for the final hole, uh, we start our drilling. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with drilling steel, I will say to you that, number one, uh, the speed, the RPM, the speed of the drill, has to be lowered for uh, drilling steel, much lower than you would use for wood or any other material. In addition to that, you don't want to generally, you don't want to just put in the size bit that you're going to finish with, particularly if it's a larger bit. In this case, I think the whole size we're using is 5 eighths, if I'm not mistaken. So you wouldn't want to generally just go in with a 5 eighths bit, although I will say this, this material is thinner and it might work. But generally speaking, it's better practice to step up, as it's called. And what I mean by that is you start with a much smaller drill bit and you gradually step up until you get to the final dimension of hole that you need. I will also say that it's good practice after you've marked your location to uh, go ahead and hit it with a center punch so that your bit, your drill bit, can be nice and centered up to it and it won't wander on you when you first uh, go to plunge into it. 
So those are just a few tips for those of you who aren't entirely familiar with uh, drilling. Also, you notice I don't have every anything clamped down here. There's two uh, rules of thought to that. Some people like to clamp stuff in. Others people like to f others like to free float like I'm doing here because they feel that free floating allows the bit to find its way. Uh, I'm partial to that myself, not to mention the fact that it's uh, quicker, but you do have to make sure you have a firm hold on it so it doesn't spin out of your control and uh, injure you. Okay, so let me take a moment to explain to you what I'm going to do here and how I'm going to line this arm up properly. Now, my table, my welding table, I know is square in the corners. I know this because I've measured it in the past and, and I've checked it and it's square with, you know, longer uh, straight edge. And uh, anyhow, so here I have a speed square, okay? Just to show you, to verify, you can see, now granted on a big table like this you probably want something a little longer to be able to uh, indicate that to you, but again, I've done it before so I know it's square, so take my word for it. Anyhow, since I have this all squared away, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one that I need to replace, and I'm going to put it right along the edge of my table. Then I'm going to take this, this piece, and it actually has some nice little, uh, oh, I guess some little stops here that are holding it up against the edge of the table. And I'll slide this guy into place, and also I'll bring this out a bit because if we notice on the other one here, and I'll show you guys in just a minute, on the other one we have uh, a little bit of a stick out, and we're going to get it just like that. So, okay, so there I am adjusted loosely. Let me go ahead and uh, show you what I'm talking about here. So here I am from a slightly different angle. You can see on this side it's actually protruding a little bit here. So I've actually brought this out to protrude a little bit just to mimic that side so they look about right. Uh, the edge here, if you notice, I'll pan across here, the edge is right on the table. And of course I plan to clamp that down. And I'll take a measurement between here, the insides and the outsides, just to make sure everything's lined up perfectly straight. And when it is, I'll clamp everything down and then I'll start tacking it all into place. Yes, there's a little bit of a gap here, but we'll go ahead and weld it anyway because, uh, you know, when we cut this, this came out kind of not as good as we would like to just because of the nature of the bad welds that were there before. So we're going to have to deal with some little gaps and when we get to the welding, I'll show you how we deal with that, okay? So finally, here we are, the moment of truth. We're going to actually weld this piece together now. Uh, this is simply welding square tubing, and to start off, I'm going to go ahead and tack it in place. That way we can be relatively sure that our welds are uh, going to uh, be placed properly. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and tack this uh, guy up. Now, I only have access to three corners, but I'm going to try to get into the inside there, and you can't really see it, but trust me, I got as low as I could there. And the reason why I want to tack the corners is to try to prevent it from moving. You notice I have everything clamped down. Um, that may or may not stay depending on the situation. We'll see how it goes. Well, this video uh, definitely demonstrates a truism in welding, and that is that uh, the actual welding part of any project is probably only about 10 to 15 percent. The rest is prep, cutting, drilling, you name it. So here we are finally welding and uh, we're doing, I'm doing a little side to side motion to cover the gap on that last one. And here on this one I'm doing a little bit of a, uh, what we would call a cursive E I suppose, or a circular motion, uh, just to try to get a nice even fillet weld top and bottom uh, to cover this portion of it. And finally on the last one here, uh, I have kind of an awkward position because I have this little padding piece that's kind of sticking up there. but. I'm going to try to bury it in there tight and get it the very best I can. Uh, and I'm going to do a little bit of a side to side action just to fill in that fillet and make sure that both sides get everything equally. Anyhow, uh, well listen, uh, we're about at the end of this project and it was a successful one. I hope that uh, you have enjoyed this one, I certainly have. Uh, remember Fabtech uh, 2016 is coming and I'll be there. Uh, you'll see another video that will show when I'll be there. So thanks for joining me and uh, hope to see you in Fabtech. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.